happy Hanukkah. Sorry that it's a little bit, we're starting a little bit late today because of uh, Hanukkah. Um, I find it somewhat ironic to be studying Mar Nebuchim on Hanukkah because this is the time when we celebrate our defeat over the Greeks and that includes their, philosophi- their philosophy. If anyone needs a, you know, a copy of Mar Nebuchim of the introduction, please take one. Um, and here we are studying the Rambam who felt that who felt that Greek philosophy contains the answers to what we need to know. Um, I'm sorry, I just have to change the uh, I'm just going to change the uh, Okay. All right, so let's so let's get started. Um, we are on page ten in the Times introduction. We had just started mentioning uh, last last time that the Rambam re- refers back to the three different groups of people that he had made mention of many years ago when he wrote his commentary to the Mishnah. And he said that there are three groups of people within, within Kalal Yisrael who study the words of the Nevi'im and the words of the prophets. Uh, the words of the prophets and the words of the sages, rather. And these people, the first group, are very simplistic kinds of people, and they look at everything at face value. If Chazal say something, no matter how outlandish it may seem, well, that's what they said, and therefore we have to accept it, no matter how silly or provincial it may seem. The second group looks at the words of our sages, and they say, you know, no, no intelligent person can possibly believe this or accept it, and this causes them to reject certain statements of our sages. Now, here in the Mora Nevuchim, the Rambam adds one little facet to this, and he says that this would not, he says, uh, it's, it's on page 10 on the fifth line, if however a perfect man of virtue should engage in speculation on them in these midrashim, he cannot escape one of two courses. Either he can take the speeches in question in their external sense and in so doing think ill of their author, and regard him as an ignoramus. And so that, that's the second group of people. They look at the words of the Midrash, or the, the, the words of the Agadita, and they say, this is ridiculous. Anyone who wrote this must be provincial and silly. And notice this phrase, he says, in this there is nothing that would upset the foundations of belief. This is something that he did not write in his Mishnah commentary. He didn't write that he's laying them off easy in that he says, you know what, if you reject something that the rabbis say, you're not, a, you're not an apikairis. If you look at a piece of agadita and you say it doesn't make sense and I, can't, I don't think the rabbis knew what they were talking about. It's not an appropriate thing to say, but it doesn't make you into a heretic. Now why does the Rambam make that point over here? As you'll see, there are two texts that the Rambam is addressing in the Mora Nevuchim. He's referring to rabbinic text, Midrash, or Agadata, but he's also referring to the words of the Nevi'im, the prophets. And this is what the Ephodi, one of the commentaries, points out. He says, if you reject something that the rabbis say, because it seems too provincial or it's patently untrue, as long as it doesn't affect your halachic practice, you're not a heretic. But if you reject something words of the Torah, or words of even in the Tanakh, and if you say that the words of the Nevi'im are untrue, so then you are, you are in a different camp. And that's why the Rambam made this contrast over here. To say something disparaging about the sages is very not nice, but it doesn't make you michutz lamachana, it doesn't make you a heretic. But to disparage the words of the Nevi'im 
already puts you outside the camp of Israel. It's, that, that, that borders on heresy or perhaps is heresy itself. So <coughs> the third category is that he can attribute to them an inner meaning, thereby extricating himself from his predicament and being able to think well of the author whether or not the inner meaning of the saying is clear to him. This is the third group that the Rambam in his Mishnah commentary had said is, almost, is, all, is such a small percentage of people who really get to the bottom of and really understand that the rabbis speak using homily and metaphor and that they mean something much deeper than is at the face value. With regard to the meaning of prophecy, the exposition of its varying degrees and the elucidation of the parables occurring in the prophetic books, another manner of explanation is used in this treatise. Now, now he switches from Midrash and he switches to Nach or Tanach. He says when we look at some, some of the uh, metaphorical text that appears in Tanakh, that's a different story. And we actually have to be much more careful and esoteric in our, in our unpacking of these ideas. That the, what the Rambam is alluding to over here is, is that originally I had planned to write a very explicit explanation of all of the places in Tanakh where the rabbis are speaking in metaphor and I was planning to reveal quite overtly all of the things that they really meant on the deeper level. But I realized that this was not going to be helpful. The general populace would not benefit from it because it would be over their head and perhaps would confuse them further. And the already initiated class, I have to explain it to them in a way that is only uh, appropriate for someone who's already initiated. And therefore, I have to be like the uh, Barbanel's language. I have to be megale tefach and mechaset fachaim. The sages use that term. I have to reveal one, one handbreadth and conceal two handbreadths. I will also be speaking esoterically, says the Rambam, in the way that I present this information. I'll be exposing what the, what the words of Tanakh and the words of the Midrash really mean, but I will be doing it only so that an initiated person who's wise enough to understand what I mean will fully understand. Okay, and then he writes, in view of these considerations, we have given up composing these two books in the way in which they were begun, referring to those two works that he said that he had originally planned to write, and we have confined ourselves to mentioning briefly the foundations of belief and general truths while dropping hints that approach a clear exposition, just as we have set them forth in the great legal compilation Mishnah Torah. What we see here, what the Rambam, I believe, is referring to is the, a reference to all of the intellectual knowledge that a Jew must harbor in order to be a faithful Jew. And he says, I'm going to mention them um, uh, uh, briefly, and I'll tell you basic ideas that a Jew has to know without uh, masking those ideas over. But they will be mentioned briefly, like, just like they're mentioned in Mishnah Torah. And here he's referring to the Ikare Amuna, the foundations of belief, because once again, the purpose of this book is to imbue the seeking individual not only to resolve all of the conflicts and confusion that he may have, but also to make him have the proper intellectual ideas harbored in his mind so that he can gain perfection and dvekas with Hashem. In order to do that, you have to know, you have to have a working knowledge of the 13 principles of faith. And this is what the Rambam says I'm going to be making reference to in this work as well. We mentioned before that you know Strauss, in his introduction to Mar Nevuchim, had provided a very intricate kind of layout, dividing Mar Nevuchim into seven different sections, even though the Rambam only breaks down his work into three different units, Chelek Aleph, Chelek Gimel, and uh, Chelek Beis, and Chelek Gimel. And many of the commentaries are at a loss to try and understand why the Rambam breaks down the Mornavuchim into three sections. There doesn't seem to be a clean break from section A to section B to section C. Um, it's interesting, um, uh, Joel Majonis, who's in the hospital now, I should have a refuah shalema, sent me a very interesting article by Professor Menachem Kellner. And in that article, uh, uh, Dr. Kellner observes that Rav Shimon ben Semach Duran, who was a very important Rishon, spoke a lot about philosophical ideas in Judaism, is the first person to break down the Rambam's 13 principles of faith into three sections. And 
A number of commentaries observe this. We know that Rambam has 13 principles of faith, but if you want to break them down into easier to digest units, there's really three basic principles of faith, or three categories of faith principles. One is about God, the second is about Torah, and the third is about what we call Sachar Va'onesh, or providence, that God is a providential God, and man is accountable to God for his, for his actions. If you look at a breakdown of the 13 principles of faith, you will note that the first five of the 13 all refer to an essential belief in some aspect of the Creator, some aspect of Rav Shalom, either that God is one, or that God is the first and last, and so forth. The second unit deals with the veracity and the faithfulness of the transmission of the Torah and the prophets. Those are the next four. And then the last four of the principles of faith I'll talk all about the benefit of mitzvot and that God rewards and punishes and the messianic age and the resurrection of the dead and so forth. So, so uh, Kellner's thesis, which seems to work very nicely, uh, is that the first section of Mora Nebuchim deals with God and deals with the first five principles of faith. The second unit of Mora Nebuchim, Chelek Beis, deals with the transmission of Torah and the veracity of prophecy. And the third section deals with the last four principles of faith, which talk all about sachar va'onesh and the performance of mitzvot and what awaits us in the afterlife. Um, you have to do a little kneching and kvetching in order to make it work, but that would be a basic structure. And this could be what the Rambam means over here, that he's going to be making mention of the principles of faith and belief throughout this work, but ultimately this work is structured on the Shalosha Asar Ikarim. Let's go on. We're now going to get into the Rambam, get, really getting into the whole idea of metaphor and why our sages speak in metaphor, why the Tanakh, why the prophets speak in metaphor as well. My speech in the present treatise is directed, as I have mentioned, to one who has philosophized and has knowledge of the true sciences, but believes at the same time in the matters pertaining to the law and is perplexed as to their meaning because of the uncertain terms in the parables. So, this is who I've written my book for. I've mentioned this before. It's not geared towards the uh, provincial person who has not studied philosophy. It is geared towards a person who has studied philosophy and is perplexed by how to reconcile what appears to be patently true in the world of philosophy with Torah. We shall include, and, and the only way to reconcile it properly is to point out when the Torah speaks in metaphor and to try to take terms and words in the Torah and Tanakh and the Midrash that seem at face value to mean one thing and to show you how they mean something different. We shall include in this treaty some chapters in which there will be no mention of an equivocal term. What that means is that there are some chapters of Mora Nebuchim which will not expound explicitly on some term or phrase which is equivocal, which means that it has more than one meaning and we have to get to the deeper meaning. But such a chapter will be preparatory for another or it will hint at one of the meanings of an equivocal term <coughs> that I might not wish to mention explicitly in that place or it will explain one of the parables or hint at the fact that a certain story is a parable. So equivocal terms, words that describe God especially, that may, mean one th that may at face value mean one thing or mean something different, that's what I'm going to be working on in this work. And I'll also be telling you when the Torah speaks in parable and explain and unpack all of the parables of Tanakh. Such a chapter may contain strange matters regarding which the contrary of the truth is sometimes is believed, either because of the equivocality of the terms or because a parable is taken for the thing that represented, that being represented or vice versa. Which means is that, that you're going to read certain things in chapters of this, of this book that are going to seem bizarre to you, they're going to seem strange, because you had always, I'm going to be explaining to you how a chapter from Tanakh or a passage from Chazal means one thing when you always thought it meant something totally different. So you're going to be reading stuff in this book that's going to go, wait, what is he talking about? And when you think about it, he says, look, I'm trying, he's basically, I'm saying, I'm preparing you to be amazed. I'm preparing you to be shocked a little bit, but don't be realize that what I'm telling you is correct. Now that I've talked about parables, says the Rambam, let me explain to you 
what the world of parables is all about in, in, the term, in the words of the prophets and the sages. We shall make the following introductory remarks. Know that the key to the understanding of all that the prophets, peace be on them, have said, and to the knowledge of its truth, is an understanding of the parables, of their import, and of the meaning of the words occurring in them. In other words, you've got to realize that the Nevi'im speak in parable. Never, uh, almost never, take their words at face value and appreciate that there's something much deeper. You know what Hashem, may he be exalted, has said, and to the ministry of the prophets have I used similitudes. Basically, Hashem says explicitly that I use the Nevi'im to speak in metaphor. And you know that he has said, put forth a riddle and speak a parable. You know, too, that because of the frequent use prophets make of parables, the prophet has said, they say of me, is he not a maker of parables? Okay? So you know how Shlomo began his book to understand the proverb in a figure, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. This is the introduction to the book of Proverbs. Now there's a medrash that, uh, that opens up or explains what, what Shlomo HaMelech's project was when he wrote Mishalim, when he wrote parables or proverbs. To what were the words of the Torah to be compared before the advent of Shlomo? To a well, the waters of which are at a great depth and cool, yet no man could drink of them. Now what did one clever, clever man do? In other words, the waters are sweet, but they're inaccessible. So what does the smart man do? He joined cord with cord and rope with rope and drew them up and drank. Thus did Solomon say one parable after another and speak one word after another until he understood the meaning of the words of the Torah. And therefore, parables have a cumulative effect according to this Midrash. Sometimes you need to provide not just one parable to understand a very esoteric, complex idea, but you need to use multiple parables. That's the cord to cord, rope to rope. Okay? Um, that is literally what they say. I do not think that anyone possessing an unimpaired capacity imagines that the words of the Torah referred to here that one contrives to understand through understanding the meaning of parables are ordinances concerning the building of Sukkot, Lulav, and the law of four trustees. In other words, what the Rambam is writing over here now is when the rabbis say that it's in order to understand the words of the Tanakh, you need to speak in parable, He's not refer the Torah, the, the Medrash is not referring to very straightforward mitzvahs. The Torah does not speak in parable when it tells you to build a sukkah. The Torah does not speak in parable when it tells you to take a, 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 a lulav and an esra. But what does the what does the Medrash mean when it says that the that it's necessary to speak in parable? Rather, what this text has in view here is, without any doubt, the understanding of obscure matters or esoteric or deep matters involving physics and metaphysics like we've discussed before. <coughs> About this, it has been said, our rabbis say, a man loses a sela or a pearl in his house. A sela is a valuable coin, or he loses a pearl in his house. Uh, can find the pearl by lighting a taper, uh, which is like a, a, a candle. He can light a candle worth an isar, worth a very small amount, and he can go ahead and he can find the precious pearl. In the same way, this parable is itse itse in itself is worth nothing, but by means of it you can understand the words of the Torah. So what does that mean? It means that the Medrash has said quite explicitly that the external uh, words of the Tanakh are like this very inexpensive candle, but they provide illumination to help you find the lost pearl, just like the rope helps you draw water. These are different mishalim to describe the idea. So, in, in, in effect, it's, it's, it's interesting. In effect, he, the sages use the, the mechanism of, par of parable or metaphor to describe the metaphorical use of, of, of stories and metaphors in, uh, that is to be found in, in Tanakh. We can explain how metaphor is used in Tanakh with metaphors. That's essentially what the Rambam is saying, right? This too is literally what they say. Now consider the explicit affirmation of the sages, may their memory be blessed, that the internal meaning of the words of the Torah is a pearl, whereas the external meaning of all parables is worth nothing. And their comparison of the concealment of the subject by its parables external meaning 
is to a man who let drop a pearl in his house which was dark and full of furniture. The pearl is there, but he doesn't see it and does not know where it is. It is as though it were no longer in his possession, as it is impossible for him to derive any benefit, any benefit from it, until, as has been mentioned, he lights a lamp, an act to which an understanding of the meaning of the parable corresponds. Now, I want to be very clear over here, and the Abarbanel makes this point. When the Medrash says that the external parable, or the, the, the wick that he uses to search the, for the pearl is worth nothing, it doesn't mean literally that it's worth nothing. It means that it's worth nothing when compared to the great value of the pearl. As we'll see in just a moment, the Rambam is going to point out to us that even the face value of what, this, of what the Nevi'im write has value, but it may be a value that, let's say, I could find in secular culture as well. So, for example, if we find in the words of Pirkei Avos, or we find in the words of the Navi, that, you know, it's good to be thrifty, it's good to be frugal, right? Well, that's something that is a universal concept that we don't need a prophet to explain to me. However, using the words of the text itself, we might be able to see that there's a much deeper meaning in the way that the Navi <coughs> phrased that maxim of it's good to be frugal. And what we will discover after noting that the words are structured in a certain way that there's something far more esoteric and deep that he means on a mystical level as well. And that's why he has to bring the next parable. He says, the sages have said, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in maskiot of silver. Now, if you remember when we first, when we first introduced Moranavuchim, I told you that this is like the Rambam's favorite pasuk in all of Tanakh. Now, it's... Um, um, uh, what is it? Tapuche zahav b'maskiot kesef, davar davur al ofnav. That golden apples fit into an outlay of silver <coughs> is a word wisely spoken. Now, what does that mean? So the Rambam says, hear now an elucidation of the thought that has that he has set forth. This is what is contained in Proverbs. The term maskiot denotes filigree traceries. I mean to say traceries in which there, there are apertures with very small eyelets, like the handiwork of silversmiths. I mentioned to you before, it's basically like a piece of artwork which has gold uh, art in the background, and it's overlaid with silver that has small spokes or, or holes over it, so that you, if you're looking at it from a distance, you can only see the silver, but you go up close, or sometimes it's in a wheel, and you spin the wheel, you can see the gold apples or the golden artwork that is behind the silver. Um, they are so called because a glance penetrates through them, because in Aramaic, the, the word vayashkeith means the iskas, the, uh, the isteche, which is from the word maskuyot, and therefore they're the same. The sage accordingly said that a saying uttered with a view to two meanings is like an apple of gold overlaid with silver filigree work having very small holes. <clears throat> now see how marvelously this dictum describes a well-constructed parable. For he says that in a saying that has two meanings, he means an external and an internal one, the external meaning ought to be as beautiful as silver, while its internal meaning ought to be more beautiful than the external one, the former being in comparison to the latter as gold is to silver. Its external meaning also ought to contain in it something that indicates to someone considering it what is to be found in its internal meaning, as happens in the case of an apple of gold overlaid with silver filigree work having very small holes. In other words, the external meaning of the Pasuk is worth is, is pretty, but compared with the inner meaning, which is the gold underlay, it's really, by comparison, it's not worth very much. But it still is attractive, and it still draws you in, and it still has value, and it's in some way is indicative of a deeper meaning that is meant with the, with the gold underlay. When looked at from a distance or with imperfect attention, it is deemed to be an apple of silver, but when a keen-sighted observer looks at it with full attention, its interior becomes clear to him, and he knows that it is of gold. The parables of the prophets piece of be upon them are similar. Their external meaning contains wisdom that is useful in many respects, among which is the welfare of human societies. 
So the Rambam writes this. He says, listen, it's not that if you read the book of Proverbs, you're going to get absolutely nothing unless you plumb its depths. You'll get an external meaning, and there'll be a lot of very practical advice. You know, work hard, work assiduously, you know, look at the ant and how, the, you know, how hard the ant works, and, and there's so many, and don't be lazy, and, uh, and don't uh, give in to your physical temptations. All of the things that are contained in the book of Proverbs, those are fantastic ideas that will help you get through life well. But you could have picked up a book of Confucius or a book of Aristotle, and you would have gotten the same lessons as well as you would have gotten from the book of Proverbs. But that means that you're also not getting the deeper meaning, as is shown by the external meaning of Proverbs and similar sayings. Their internal meaning, on the other hand, contains wisdom that is useful for beliefs concerned with the truth as it is. So this is the Rambam's sort of introduction to the whole idea of, um, of, uh, of the idea of the parable. And then he goes a little bit deeper, and he tells us that prophetic parables are of two kinds, and I don't want us to get bogged with, down with too much detail, and we may, maybe we'll just gloss over the next, um, I'll just paraphrase the next uh, page or so. And basically the Rambam says that there are certain types of parables where every single detail of the parable means something specific. And therefore you have to break down the parable in all of its component parts and understand that each part is a different message. So he gives us an example. He says the, story, the dream that Yaakov had of the sulam, of the ladder, has multiple components. He says the word ladder indicates one subject. Set mutzav uh, arza, set down on the earth, is another lesson. The roshoma gia hashamayma, it's the head of the ladder going up to heaven, is a different lesson. And therefore, in parables, sometimes you have to break down the parable into its, into its um, individual components in order to be able to understand that there are multiple different messages in one parable. But then he says there are other types of parables where there's one universal message, and you, you can't allow yourself to get bogged down in the details because the details do not contain... Uh, uh, each detail of the parable does not contain a specific piece of information. And for that he gives, for, he brings from the book of Mishle. And it's not clear to me whether he's making this division because one is the Pentateuch and one is uh, King Solomon. It could be that that's the reason why you have to be much more exacting in your unpacking of a, pro, of a parable that is contained in the Chumash versus a parable that's contained in Proverbs. That could be true. But it could also just be that he's just speaking in generalities. You need a wise person to guide you and to let you know when something said by the Nevi'im, which is a metaphor, has to be broken down into its constituent parts because there are multiple lessons. And when you have to just take it in its totality and appreciate that there's one universal message and don't get bogged down by the details because sometimes the details are only provided in order to enhance the parable and make it more palatable but not necessarily to provide you with additional information of the, of the deeper message. Okay? And that's what the Rambam wants to communicate over here. And I'm, just, I'm going to conclude with something that the Rambam here does not write, but which is contained in the Kuzari. And it's a very, very important idea which needs to, it requires a little bit of thought to sort of cogitate on it a little bit. Rabbi Yehuda Levi says something that for the, when I read it for the first time, I was a little bit taken aback. But he says that there are many times when you'll read something in the words of our sages that seems outlandish. But know that if the Chachamim were so wise that they could come up with intricate systems of damages and tort law and, uh, and very intricate Hilcha Shabbos with 39 Malachas and break everything down so, so to such fine detail, they were men of wisdom. And their wisdom did not shut off when they spoke homiletically. And if you really, if therefore, if you read something that they write that seems provincial or outlandish, understand, like the Rambam writes, that it has an external meaning and an internal meaning. And then he writes that there were times that a student heard his teacher say something of this kind, that it was a parable, and he didn't understand it and transmitted it nonetheless. In other words, Part of the transmission process of Torah Shabbat Alpeh 
is to transmit some of these stories and homilies and metaphors even when the person transmitting it himself doesn't fully appreciate the inner meaning of that statement or inner meaning of that parable. And the reason why this is so important is because it sort of uh, uh, um, reinforces the importance of making sure that there's a, a faithful transmission of Torah Shabbat Because essentially what Rabbi Huda Levi was trying to communicate to us is that there are going to be generations where we learn stuff and we don't understand it, but we, but we have none, nonetheless a duty to uh, retain its transmission. Because you may not appreciate it today, but that's because you didn't see the deeper meaning. But you still need to pass it forward. Because by passing it forward, you're providing the next person down the road the opportunity to appreciate what you did, were not able to appreciate. And so therefore, when we look at it with that sense of reverence, it places the responsibility of the preservation of Torah Shabbat in, in, in a very new, very different light. Comments, questions? Anyone want to say anything? Yes, go right ahead. Um, so when you, you mentioned that um, Rambam says you're going to be surprised by what I tell you, it's going to be different than what you have always learned. Does he say that up until now, even though you've all been, you, let's say, you come to your books, these books have been taught by rabbis and, and sages, no one's understood until I shed the light now on it. Is, is that what you say? That there's been misunderstanding until now, and I'm the only one that's going to? I don't think he's saying he's the only one, but he's clearly saying that there's been misunderstanding until he, he wrote this book. Um, and he really did view it as his role to try and alleviate some of the confusion. That's why he wrote, so I called Noren of Luchim, right? I don't think that he believed that he was the only one, but he did feel that he was in a very small group of people. Okay. Where, where, does the, uh, the, where does the people that the Kuzari is talking about that pass on the, the, the words of the Nevi'im without total understanding, where, where does that person fit in with <laughs> the Rambam's categorization of the, the, the people that he's speaking to? I, I mean, I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. The Rambam didn't really <clears throat> account for that kind of person. It, but it's, I guess, a person who, in the, in the third category, knows that the rabbis or the Nevi'im mean something deep, tries to plumb its depths. Sometimes you succeed and sometimes you don't. So that, he probably would be part of the third category, <laughs> but, but sort of a third category <clears throat> wannabe. You know, guy who wants to be part of that category just hasn't been able to make it yet. Okay? Have a great day. Happy